Good morning, Genesis Church. How are you guys this morning? I don't see smiles because of the mask. Thank you for the thumbs up. Everybody else good this morning? Yes, Some head nods. There you go, there you go. Well, I, we are glad you are here and we're back this morning. We're excited to be back. Uh, we know we can worship the Lord and really gather anywhere that we are, but we like gathering together right here on Sunday morning. So we're happy to be back. I'm glad that you are here joining with us at Genesis Church. Go ahead and stand with me. We're going to start by reading scripture. We love to have you stand for the reading of the word, and then we will go into worship. So I decided uh, Matthew 6, 25 is where I'm going to start this morning. I've been reading this section of scripture a lot. I feel like it's kind of fitting for the time that we are in. So this is what I'll read for you this morning. If you want to go there, you can, or you can just listen. Matthew 6, 25. For this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or gather in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow, and they do not toil, they do not spin. Yet I say to you that none of them, that even, not even Solomon in all his glory, clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not so much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear or what will happen tomorrow or when will this pandemic go away, right? What will happen with the election? Do not worry about these things. For the Gentiles eagerly seek all of these things, but the heavenly Father knows your needs. He knows. He knows what you have need of. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all things will be added to you. You know, God already knows exactly what it is that you need today. He knows what you're here with. He knows the struggles. He knows what you, what you have need of from him. He already knows. And what he asks you to do is to seek him first and to let him take care of your needs. So that's what we're going to do this morning. I'm going to ask you that when we go into prayer, that you spend a little time just laying down the things that are on your mind. Your worries, your needs, your cares, we all have them, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that, right? We've all got bills to pay and things to do, right? Those things are on our minds a lot of the time. But right now, at this time, what I'm going to ask you to do is lay those things down and seek him first. Let's just focus on seeking God. He's worth our time to spend focused on him, right? Leave those things behind, even if just for this time when we're worshiping. So Father, we lay our worries down. Go ahead and do that. Just, Father, we lay our worries down. We cast our cares on you because you care for us. God, we thank you, Father, that you already know what it is that we need and instead of focusing on our need this morning and focusing on the things that consume our minds, God, we choose this morning to focus ourselves on you. We choose to seek you this morning because you are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be worshiped. You are worthy of all of our affection and all of our attention this morning. And this morning we focus ourselves on you. We turn our eyes to you and our hearts to you. And we praise you with everything that we have, with nothing in our way. And it's because of Jesus we can come. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. is free You came to bring us liberty My sin and my rejection and your blood and my acceptance Now I'm alive to bring you praise and where the spirit of the Lord is there is 
guess I will fight my battles Is it able that you've prepared for me In the presence of my enemies It's your body and your blood you shed for me This is how I fight my battle oh, oh. And I believe you overcome And I will live my soul Praise for what you've done This is how I fight my battle This is how I fight my battle This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. In the valley, I know that you're with me. And surely. Your goodness and your mercy follow me. So my weapons are praise and thanksgiving. This is how I fight my battles. I believe and I What? 
you've done and I believe you've overcome and I will live my soul praise for what you and I believe and I believe you've overcome and I will live my soul This is how I fight my battle. This is how I fight my battle. This is how I fight my battle. Oh, this is how. This is how I fight my battle. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battle. Oh, this is how. Like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, I'm surrounded by you. Like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Be close, close to your side, so heaven is weak and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above singing as one.
two-year-old son and I've been singing hymns to him every night before we go to bed and one we've been singing lately is his eye is on the sparrow and I sing because I'm happy and I sing because I'm free his eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me and my, my son calls it because when he asks for it he wants me to sing because because and I kept trying to correct him and teach him the real name of the song but you know what I realized is that's a pretty good name because he is our because Right? We sing because of him. We are free because of him. We are worthy because of him. We can go stand in the face of uncertainty because of him. We can walk into the unknown because of him. We can speak the truth because of him. And no matter what happens in this world, we have life eternal because of him. The great I am is not only big and wonderful and powerful, which he is, but he is also the reason that we have relationship with him. He's the reason that we can represent him in this world that needs him so badly. So let's sing this again. Let's start with uh, the mountains tremble and let's keep singing this and let's worship our God because he is our reason. He is our because. The mountains shake before you the demons run and flee at the mention of your name king of majesty there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great i am the great
Father, you are great. You are great. Just think about that this morning. He is so great. God, you are so great. You are so great. You are so great. No matter what is going on, you are greater. No matter what our needs are, you are greater. God, you are so great. And we worship you this morning. You are worthy to be praised. Father, we thank you that you came and rescued us, God. You came and saved us so that we could have relationship with you, so that we could worship you and share your love with a hurting and dying world. God, you are so worthy to be praised. You are so worthy to be praised. This is one of those times I just want to sing this song like a hundred more times, but I know we got to move on. But God, we just pray right now that you, God, you just seal what you have done this morning in worship. The beautiful gift that was given to you this morning as we praised and we worshiped. And we laid our lives down before you, God, because you are worthy of our praise. God, we thank you that you are a reason for being. You are our because. You are the reason we sing. You are the reason for our hope. You are the reason for everything that we do. In you we live and we move and we have our being. We thank you, Father, for who you are. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That was good, yes, guys? That was good. Let's give it up for our worship team, and then you can have a seat. And before they leave, I'd just like to point out, you know, Tim and Luke and I are all matching today. So this is the official outfit of fall, apparently, the, the denim shirt and the black pants. So I just thought I'd let you know in case, in case you were unclear about that. Um, all right, so I am Leslie Absher. For those of you that don't know me, I'm one of the leaders here at Genesis Church, and we are glad to be with you this morning. Uh, happy to have you. That was, that was good worship. I enjoyed that a lot. Um, we love worship here at Genesis Church. Uh, we love prayer here at Genesis Church, and we love the word here at Genesis Church. And we, we want to get into all three of those things because we believe that that is biblical and what, that's what the Lord calls us to do when we come together as the body of Christ. So we're blessed to be with you to do that this morning. Um, we have a couple of announcements which should come up on the screen, I hope, because I forgot my little notes. Um, we have a couple announcements. There we go. Okay. Uh, so Wednesday morning, I think this one's coming, or Wednesday morning, Wednesday night, we have youth group. Uh, Pastor Isaac is actually going to see the youth again at 6.30 p.m. There's my slide. Uh, Genesis Youth resumes August 26th. So if you are a Genesis Youth, you junior high, high school kid, um, you've got junior high and high schoolers in your household, please bring them. Uh, Wednesday nights, Pastor Isaac is relatively new at our church. He is awesome. He is on fire. He loves the Lord. He's excited about what God is doing in this place in Bloomington, Indiana. Um, so we love Pastor Isaac, and we know he's going to do good things with the youth on Wednesday. So come to youth on Wednesday if that is your category. Uh, and then our next announcement, baptismal service. Thanks, Tim. He's yelling at me from the, the pews because I don't have my notes. Uh, baptismal service, so November 1st at 11 o'clock in the 11 o'clock service, which you're in right now, uh, we will do baptismals. So this is a really exciting time because people are dedicating and publicly declaring their faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's exciting. Yes. Yes. I got one clap. Yes. This is good, right? We love when people declare their faith in Jesus Christ. This is a joyful service. So it's, it's fun uh, to be at, to celebrate with the people who are getting baptized. If you're interested in getting baptized, please email us at info at igenesischurch.com. You can also talk to Pastor Tim. We'd be happy to set that up for you. Um, but we'd love for you to come and witness that and to celebrate with these people as they declare their faith in Christ by being baptized. So that is wonderful. Um, I know Tim's going to talk about house church, so I'm going to let him do that when he come up, comes up here. So the next announcement is about offering. So usually we, you know, pass the basket and, uh, you know, it seems weird that we used to do that, right? We all touch the basket as it went around. We don't do that anymore because of Rona. So uh, now you can give online or there is a basket in the back. You can put your checks in the back. You can also mail checks to the church igenesischurch.com slash give. That is the simplest and easiest way to do it if you have a phone and you've got that all set up. So please do that today. And really it's a blessing to give to God, right? It's a joy to be able to give to him what it is that he's given to you. It doesn't matter the amount that you give. 
It's the heart with which you give it. So if you've got anything and you feel like you want to give and to sow into this church and the work that's being done, please, please do that. And we're able to bless others when you do that, which is really great too. We're able to sow into our community and sow into other ministries and just further the kingdom of God. So thank you for your faithful giving, especially during this time when it can be a little more difficult as well. Um, Okay, so as Tim comes up, I'm going to remind you that we pass the peace now. We used to shake hands and used to call it the hallelujah howdy back in my day. Uh, So... uh, (laughs) We, uh, yeah, that makes me feel really old. But anyway, uh, we used to do that. But now what we do is we get out our phones and we text someone that we're thinking about, you know. And if they're Christians, you may say the peace of the Lord be on you. But if they're not Christians, you can just say, hey, I'm thinking about you. I wanted to bless you this morning and just let you know that I I hope you have peace in your life. And and it's been a great way, actually, for me to connect with some people that I don't normally connect with, especially because of the pandemic. Um, So do that right now. Get your phones out if that's something you like to participate in. And go ahead and pass the peace. And then I will pass the mic to Pastor Tim. All right, good morning, Genesis Church. Welcome back. Welcome back. Let's try that again. All right, good to see you guys. Um, wow, it's good to be here. We uh, Thanks, Ben. I appreciate it. You know, th- these, these are remarkable times we are living in. These are the, the word everyone hates to hear, unprecedented times. Uh, but they truly are. And uh, we, we just are learning and growing, adapting and trying to be as flexible as possible, and I just thank you for that. You know, last Sunday we decided to take the week off because the previous Sunday we had a case of corona. It was our first case, and we just wanted to make sure we gave ourselves a 14-day window to get on top of that, to contact Trace and give ourselves some space. So we shut down the offices, we worked from home, we shut down midweek, and, uh, and we decided to gather here. But as a pastor, whenever you do that, uh, there's all kinds of mixed emotions and feelings and just things. I, I drove to church Sunday morning, because I remembered, I didn't put a sign on the door, and if anyone shows up, they're going to be like, what is going on with this church? And so I drove to church, and I drove to church crying, and I had to call one of my other pastors, yes, Pastor Tim was crying, I confessed before you today, so uh, I had to call one of my other pastor friends and just say, man, I'm discouraged, because we, we were quarantined for months, and uh, we really took careful steps, and how we reopened, and registration and everything, and we've been having momentum going again, and back to 9-11 services, and then here we are, back in my living room, this is what we're doing this Sunday, and I just want to say thank you for your flexibility, and uh, just your adaptability, and thank you for showing up this Sunday, because I honestly showed up this morning, I went, I don't know if anybody's coming back after that fiasco, but here we are, worshiping together, loving Jesus together, and it's a beautiful thing. I do want to make you aware that because of all that is happening and how different things are right now, on October 18th, we had planned on doing a house church, and uh, we're going to table that for the new year, and here's why. Um, I had a guest speaker coming in the following weekend, had to table him, say say basically things are just so um, uh, unpredictable right now, and we need to just really be flexible and not have too much going on. And the more we talk to some of our leaders, a lot of our leaders are even getting nervous about house church because they feel more comfortable in a bigger atmosphere like this than they do their living room. Uh, some of them will try to gather outside, but it's getting colder. Um, but the reason we're tabling house church is because there may be a possibility that we have to do house church over the next couple months, period, anyways. If we ever have a case, we're going to take a Sunday off, give ourselves 14 days. And what we'll do is we'll live stream at 11 o'clock. And what we're going to encourage people to do is don't just sit in your living room by yourself watching the message. Gather with friends, gather with family, gather with some people that you feel comfortable with. Uh, Maybe some people that are in what they call like your bubble, like your 8 to 10 people, 12 people that you know we feel safe. We're roommates, we're family, have people over, watch the service together, worship together. And then in the future, we're going to go into a time of just praying together. So in, so in essence, it, it's very probable we may end up doing some house church type of stuff over the next couple of months. Because we just don't know how this is all going to look and unfold. And we have to be flexible. However, uh, in saying that, in March, we will be doing a very organized uh, program, house church, to kind of expose us to that model with different worship teams at each church and different teachers and different things like that. And so we just need to be flexible. We just need to be adaptable. And uh, it's just either easier to gather here for right now, and then if we have to cancel something, we're saying, hey, we're not gathering in person uh, tomorrow. We are going to gather online only, so gather with your friends, family, core group, resource team, whatever. And um, that's how we're going to function. So are we okay with that? If you're not okay with that, will you love me anyways? Jenny Hauge said boo in the first server. She went boo. And I said, Jennifer, I love you. Thank you for booing me on the, from the 
All right, anyway, so let's move on. <laughs> Cassie, I was waiting for a boo from you as well, so no, no boo? All right, so anyway, that's how we're going to function. And everyone say this, this too shall pass. All right, this too shall pass. Uh, the vaccine will come out, and, you know, we will get through this. And so we just have to be really uh, low-key and flexible right now and just adapt accordingly. And it's not fun. It's not the most enjoyable thing. As I said, I cried on my way to church last Sunday. Um, but I'm just glad to be back with you guys, worshiping together. And uh, it's just a good atmosphere in this place. Amen? All right, well, let's get into the book of Ephesians. If you're new to Genesis, my name's Tim. I have the privilege and honor of pastoring this wonderful congregation. And something we say a lot here, kind of jokingly, but we're a little bit serious like it, with it, is that we love to worship like Pentecostals and preach like Presbyterians. And we love to be expressive in our worship. We love to be loud in our worship. We love to be uh, physically expression in our worship. But then when we get to the Word, we love to go through books of the Bible and do what's called expository preaching, where we just go through books, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and really do our best to practice what's called exegesis, which means we're looking for the, what the original author is saying to the original audience and why that is important for us today. We never want to go to the scriptures and try to make the scriptures mean something they would have never meant for the original audience. All right, so before we ever get to the hermeneutic, the application, we got to do some homework, right? We got to get into the word, we got to study, and we got to pray and really digest on the scriptures and really find out what is being said and then allow the spirit to use that to speak profoundly to us in the here and now. And so we go through a lot of books of the Bible. And so several weeks ago, we started this series on the book of Ephesians. It's a circular letter that the Apostle Paul has written to many different churches in Southwest Asia Minor. And ultimately, it probably ends up at the church at Ephesus. And Paul writes this beautiful piece of literature, this inspired word of God, to essentially convey a couple things. In chapters 1 through 3, he is really laying out this robust theology and doctrine about understanding our identity of who we are in Christ, all right? And so the chapters 1 through 3 is all about identity. It's all about knowing who we are in Jesus and how that speaks to our future, how that speaks to our current, how that speaks to how we belong to a community. In chapters 4 through 6, there's a transition, and Paul goes from robust theology or orthodoxy, and he transitions to this realm of what's called orthopraxy. And the idea, I've been saying it every week, and I think it's so important, is simply this. If you believe rightly about God, you have good doctrine, it should affect and shape the way you think, the way you act, the way you interact, the way you work, the way you uh, pray for one another, the way you have community together, the way you speak to one another. And so having right orthodoxy should also lead to right orthopraxy. You with me so far? Now this morning, we're going to finish up chapter 3 here. And there's going to be essentially this transition from those two different realms. We're going to finish up kind of part one of what Paul is talking about. Now if you remember from last week, next slide here, we talked about this verse in verse 10. Where Paul says, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. And so here what Paul does is he reveals that part of the mystery of God is that God is now using this newfound community, the one new man, the church, to accomplish his purposes and plans in the world. F.F. F. Bruce said this, the church appears as God's pilot scheme for the reconciled universe of the future. The uniting of Jews and Gentiles in Christ was God's masterpiece of reconciliation and gave promise of a time when not Jews and Gentiles only, but all the mutually hostile elements in creation would be united in that same Christ. The church is not only the pattern, but also the means God is using to show his purposes are moving triumphantly to their climax. I love that the church is not only the pattern, but it's also the means God is using to show his purposes are moving triumphantly towards their climax. Now, I was sharing in the first service that um, we, we have to understand something here. And I want to kind of reveal something about this idea of what it means to be in Christ contrasted with being in Adam. A lot of times here at Genesis, I love to preach from Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And we believe that the gospel is found in Genesis 1 and 2. That the gospel is before Genesis chapter 3. Amen? 
All right? And so Genesis 1 and 2 speaks a lot to our identity and understanding of who we are. Now, in Genesis 1 and 2, Adam and Eve are created in the image of God, and they are placed in this garden. And the garden was called the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden was uh, significant of what's called the Shalom of God. The Shalom of God was not just the idea of the peace of God, but essentially it was this place where heaven and earth were one. And in the garden there was perfect peace, perfect harmony, there was beautiful love, there was awesome communion between um, God the Father and His creation. Now, Moses, who I believe writes Genesis, writes in such a way in this uh, in this written word here to reveal this idea of what's called temple language. So Genesis chapter 1, I believe it's six literal days, but I don't believe that's really the point of writing Genesis chapter 1. What Moses is doing, he's writing in a way to show that God has created the earth and placed in, earth, in the earth a temple where he puts people in the middle of this temple. Now this was very similar to many ancient pagan cultures where they would create temples, they would create statues, put, uh, make idols out of these statues, put them in the, in the temple. And when they consecrated the temple, it's said that the spirit of the gods, plural, would enter into the statues. Well in Genesis 1 and 2, Moses picks up on that idea from ancient Near Eastern cultures and he says, no, there is one true God. And he has created the earth as his temple. And he has put humanity, the first Adam and Eve, mankind, in the temple. And he breathed his ruach, his spirit, into their beings. And then they were given dominion. And they were given authority. And the idea is, take what I have placed you in and expand these boundaries. You see, outside of the garden, we don't really know what the earth was like. It was probably full of chaos and darkness and all kinds of calamity. We know that the devil and his minions were on the earth. What happens in Genesis chapter 3 is that the serpent, who is significant of the devil, comes into the shalom of God. Now remember, who is given dominion and authority in the garden? Mankind. They were given responsibility to expand uh, heaven on earth, on the earth, till one day the whole earth is full of the glory of the Lord. The serpent comes in and he begins to tempt them. And Adam and Eve, we know they compromise. They compromise because essentially they want to be their own God. They want to define what is right and wrong for themselves. And instead of booting the serpent out, they compromise with the serpent, they sin, and it leads to the brokenness of the shalom of God in the earth. Now what we see Paul do over and over again in his epistles is he picks up on that idea of creation and the creation account, and he contrasts it with what's called new creation. Of what Jesus has done to restore what was lost in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. And so where Adam and Eve compromise with the serpent and they sin, the second Adam, Jesus, in the wilderness in Matthew 4 was faithful and obedient and didn't compromise with the serpent. And what was supposed to happen in creation, Jesus has now come to bring into fulfillment what he would do in the realm of what's called new creation. And for all those that are now in the second Adam, in Christ, we now belong back to the Shalom of God project. And this is what the church is all about. The church is God's manifest plan to bring his glory to the earth. We're back to the mandate that was given to us in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And I know that we are living in a day and age where there is a lot of critique of the church. And I think a lot of it is healthy. A lot of critique that has needed to happen, especially in the church in the West, where the church has fallen short in many ways, where we have not carried our mandate well and rightly. And because of that, we are in, in essence, I believe, in a season of judgment. But God is allowing the church to be judged and exposed so that he can restore and create that which he desires for his people. But what I love about the church is that the church is God's idea, not man's. Come on, somebody. Like, are we awake this morning? Yes, there is a critique happening in the church today, and it is much needed. But at the end of the day, I still believe in the power and beauty of the ecclesia of the church. That is God's plan for creation, to bring his glory, to bring his manifest presence into the earth. Now, we talked about last week this idea of manifold. And in the Greek, next slide here, it speaks of something that is many-sided, multidimensional, diverse in nature. 
And often it was used to speak of a precious stone. So here is the big idea Paul is saying. That the church, the multi-dimensional diverse church that has many beautiful expressions and dimensions within it. Is part of God's plan to make himself known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. And that heavenly places in ancient cultures was usually like the, the middle ground, the air, the area where the demonic strongholds were at. And so the idea is that the unified, diverse church is God's master plan to drive out the strongholds and dark principalities in the earth. That was God's plan in Genesis 1 and 2, and that is God's plan in the realm of new creation for the people of God that are in Christ that belong to the advancement of his kingdom. In verse 13, Paul then kind of wraps up this part of this chapter in the first half and says, So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. And I said this last week, and I want to reiterate it. Suffering precedes glory. All right, everyone say that out loud. Suffering precedes glory. And I've been saying this a lot, and I want to I say it again, is crisis precedes renewal. Crisis precedes renewal. And so, though we may be in a time where we are experiencing difficult times or hardship, adversity, in some sense around the world, tribulation, we have to understand that suffering always precedes glory and crisis always precedes renewal. And it can become so easy to get distracted by all the trial and tribulation and anxiety and all the stuff going on in our world, stuff that's leading to anxiety, that we miss out on what we believe God is about to do in our day and age and our time. He is desiring to bring a great awakening to his church again. And though the church is not perfect, and though the church has missed it in many ways, I believe that in the midst of this exposure, he's refining his people that we would rise up and be those that he's called us to be. And it's still God's master plan to use his church, his people in the earth. Are you with me so far? You with me? All right, so let's get to our text. Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. Paul says this. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Next slide here. In verses 14 through 19, what we see here is essentially there is one long sentence of prayer and intercession in the original Greek. And so Paul, after teaching all this stuff on right doctrine and right theology, he enters into this realm of interceding or praying on behalf of these believers. I love this about the heart of the Apostle Paul. His desire is not just to give them information, but his desire for them is that they would experience transformation. And so he doesn't just teach, but then he begins to earnestly pray for them. In verses 20 through 21, Paul then breaks out in this one long doxology of high praise that transitions the theology of chapters 1 through 3 to chapters 4 through 6. And so Paul, he teaches, he enters into the realm of intercession and prayer, and then he breaks out into high praise to God. Verses 14 and 15, he says, For this reason I, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I love that. that. Think about this for a moment. The Apostle Paul, the one who is the Apostle to the Gentiles, the one that has great authority in the early church, the one who has great wisdom and knowledge and understanding. He has been given the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. He is able to make connections between the Old Testament scriptures and connect it to messianic fulfillment. He was mentored by Gamaliel, and he was a Jew of all Jews. This one with great um, 
expertise in the realm of information and knowledge and theology. He says, I, I come and I, I simply, I kneel. I posture myself in a place of humility. And I pray on behalf of the church. Do you catch the heart of Paul here? It's not just about giving a 20-minute TED Talk to motivate the people and make you feel good about your week. It's not about just teaching theology and doctrine so that your head can be puffed up with knowledge. But you see this, this apostolic oversight, this yearning where he says, I kneel and I am praying for you. Now the term father was not just a, a term of endearment. It also spoke, especially in a patriarchal society, of authority and headship. And that word headship usually spoke of the idea of being derived from, coming from. Right? Eve was uh, under Adam's headship because she was derived from Adam. We in Western radical individualistic cultures love to think in things of hierarchical structure. But a lot of times in ancient culture, especially Hebraic thought, it wasn't so much hierarchical. But it was about collective, corporate, communal. It was about the body of Christ, each with their giftings, each with their unique anointings, functioning and working together. And so the, when, when Paul talks about this idea of uh, being from the Father, it's the idea is that we are derived from the Father. And yes, he is head, and yes, he has all authority, and, and he is God and we are not. But the idea being conveyed there is that, that we are derived from his very being. As I said, kneeling was also a posture of humbling oneself and showing reverence for the position held. Now this referral to God as Father, and I want you to catch this, as the one to whom all belong and come from was very much, in fact, a political statement in Paul's day. The fact that he refers to God as the Father from which all uh, nations, every family in heaven and on earth derives his name is actually a political statement that he is making. Because in the ancient culture of Paul's day, in first century uh, context, the emperor was always considered the one that was the father of the fatherlands. Right? Because Rome ruled the earth. And the emperor was the father of the whole nation. And what Paul gets at over and over again in his literature, in his epistles, is the idea of where is your allegiance? Is your allegiance to the emperor? Is your allegiance to the systems of man and the governance of man? Is your allegiance to the trust of the financial system? Is your allegiance in your 401k? Is your allegiance in your social security? Is your allegiance in your political ideology? Or is your allegiance in God and God alone? And if you truly are the church, it's not that those other things don't matter, but first and foremost, your allegiance is to the Father of heaven and earth, and his name is Yahweh. Not Nero, not Caesar. His name is God and God alone. And so Paul, over and over again, he gets at this idea of allegiance. Ben Witherton, a great theologian, said this, God is Father not just because of the work of creation, but also because of the work of redemption. It is God that names all families. When God names, he does not simply label, but rather creates and constitutes giving identity. Verse 16 through 19. Paul goes on and says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be Filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now the word riches here, we talked about that a couple weeks ago. It speaks of extravagant or endless resources. And when it says strength and power, the idea is that, there, that these people would receive an endless portion through the spirit which now lives and dwells inside of them. And this word dwell, next slide here in the Greek, it literally means to reside, to live, to dwell to settle in, to colonize, or to make a home within. And so what Paul is doing here in this text is he is revealing how just as in the same way in the garden when God created the earth and put Eden in the middle of the earth and created it as a temple for his glory to dwell, in the new creation, because of what Jesus has done, you who have faith in Jesus now become a temple of his Holy Spirit. And his Spirit now comes and resides inside of you. Think about this for a moment. The spirit 
of the creator and sustainer of all things lives and dwells and habitates in our very being. Because of new creation, because of Christ, we are all now temples of the Spirit of God. And His presence, His glory is to be manifested in our life. And His Spirit is there to colonize us. That means to transform us, to make us more and more into His image. And so this happens individually as human beings. But the beloved people of God, we must understand that this also happens collectively when we come together. So the glory of the Lord lives and dwells inside each and every one of you. But what I love about this is that it's not just an individual thing. But as we gather here this morning, whether we're in person or whether we're online, as we gather with the people of God, the glory of the Lord is in our midst because we are the temple of His presence. He is with us. Think about it. The creator and sustainer of all things is here now. Why? Because He's in you, but He's also in us collectively. And so it's not about a building, it's not about four walls, it's not about whether we have cool hip church or whether we have lights and cameras and fog machines and laser beams and all these things. It's about none of that. It's about the people that are temples of the Holy Spirit understanding that the glory is in them. And so therefore the glory is in us collectively. This is beautiful. This is powerful. This is something that Paul is revealing that, that the Spirit comes and He dwells inside of you. Now He says established in love. And what Paul is saying here is that those who are truly in Christ, then His Spirit is truly in them. And if this is really true, then those who profess Christ should be grounded, formed in love. And not just any love, but a love that surpasses all knowledge. And I want you to see that. Love exceeds knowledge. Love exceeds knowledge. Now, many of you that know me, I, I love to study. I love to geek out on theology and doctrine. I, I love the preparation of the sermon. I love spending 12 to 14, sometimes 16 hours a week just on my message. Reading from three, four, sometimes five different commentaries. Reading and studying in church history. Understanding what the early church fathers said. Seeing the different movements throughout church history and how they interpreted the text. I geek out on that. I love knowledge. But what Paul says here is that agape love exceeds knowledge. Love exceeds knowledge. See, we are living in a day and age and in a world right now that having all the right answers or all the right apologetics or all the right defense of our faith is not going to bring genuine transformation to our city. Having good theology will not change our community. Having good theology will not change the university campus. Having good theology alone will not change your friend's life. You can have all the right answers. You can present the greatest defense of the faith. And we need to have good theology. We need to have good doctrine. But beloved, if we do not have love, if we are not rooted in radical, agape, unconditional love, we will never transform anything. Because people that are lost and that are broken and that are bound by sin... The answer they're looking for is rooted in agape love. Why? Because the world does not understand this realm of love. The world's love is contractual. I pat your back, you pat mine. I itch your shoulder, you itch mine. I do this for you, you help do something for me. And even in the realm of what's supposed to be covenant love and marriage, this is happening as well. This is why many divorces are happening today. Because we do not understand in Western culture this deep agape covenant love that is unconditional, unmerited, and it's not based off of whether anyone deserves it or not. It's the love of Jesus in us. And it is so radical. I, I counsel, my wife and I do a lot of marriage counseling with people and a lot of pre-marriage counseling. And sometimes we get to situations, not always, but sometimes we get into situations where I, I get to that point in the conversation. You ever been to that point before? Where you're just like, all right, 
All patience, grace, and love is about to go out. Well, love's still rooted there, but I'm just going to be very brutally honest with you in this moment. Anybody been there before? Come on. Can I get a witness in this place today? All right? We, you just get to that point where you're like, enough is enough. Here's the bottom line. You're selfish. Oh, how dare you say that, Pastor? No, it's true. And I love you, and this is why I'm telling you. He's selfish. She's selfish. At the end of the day, you guys are thinking in a contractual way. Radical, agape, covenantal love does not think in those lines. It is how do, how do I love, how do I serve, how do I model the love I've experienced from Jesus to this person. And Paul says that that, that type of love, that is what exceeds knowledge. The solution to the problems in the world today is not just more information. Though information is good. The solutions to all the problems in our world today is radical Agape love. We've got to get this right. Paul then goes on to a threefold filling that he envisions here. Next slide. And he essentially reveals this that number one, Christ is filled with God because he is God. Secondly, that the church is filled with God because they are what? In Christ. And then thirdly, that the cosmos are eventually filled with God through the God filled church that are all in. Once again, the church is God's masterpiece. The church is God's plan. Is the church perfect? Come on, is the church perfect? Absolutely not. It has all kind of things that it needs refining in. But the church is still God's master plan to bring his glory to the earth. To one day the whole earth is full of the glory of the Lord. Now in verse 19, I want to note this. It culminates this prayer to reveal that the ultimate goal of prayer here is that we might be filled with God to the fullest. That's an impossible feat, and yet should be an earnest desire for every believer. Now, have you ever had someone put something out in front of you, an idea, a goal, um, an opportunity, that you looked at and you said, man, that would be awesome. That would be awesome. And yet, in the back of your head, you're like, that is impossible to experience. I don't know if I'll ever get there. I don't know if I'll ever be able to obtain that. I don't know if I'll, you ever been there before? Where you're like, yes, I have a desire to encounter that, to experience that, to get to that place. And yet in the back of your head, you're like, man, I, I just don't know in the natural if that's even possible for me. And sometimes it's practical things, but sometimes it's deeper level things. I love that, that Paul, he, he gives that paradox here. He puts this thing out of them. He prays for them. He says, God, I desire that they would experience you to the fullness. And yet we know on this side of eternity, we'll never experience God to the fullness. But it should be the desire of our heart. Anyone who's ever done any type of study or obtained any type of information and education understands this truth. The more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. Right? The more you learn, the more you realize, oh my gosh, there's a whole world out there. There's a whole understanding out there. And, and I'm just not even on the tip of the iceberg in this realm. I believe if that's true in the natural, it's so much more true in the realm of the kingdom and the mystery of the kingdom. The more we experience God, the more we go, I have yet to fully experience God. And it's immeasurable. And it should be a yearning and all. I want to experience you to the fullness. And we experience him. And when we experience him, we go, oh, I have hardly yet really experienced you yet. Right? And it creates this desire. It creates this yearning in our hearts where we continually want more and more and more of God. The more we are forgiven of sin, the more we realize how sinful we are. The more we receive revelation, the more we understand we don't hardly know anything. And it creates this cycle of just yearning and desire. So Paul, he puts that paradox out. He prays, I desire that they would experience you to the fullness. To almost put a carrot out before them that, hey guys, God's heart is for you to experience him. But keep experiencing him. It's an endless journey in his presence. And so the growth, oh sorry, here Thomas Merton says this. The climate of this prayer is then one of awareness, gratitude. And totally obedient love which seeks nothing but to please God. And so the growth of every believer is, is genuinely rooted in love, is one of communion with God and obedience to his perfect will. 
And this should also be the defining measure of growth for a church body as well. I want to say this. Mission and ministry must flow out of this communion that leads to intimate knowledge of God and His ways. Mission and ministry must flow out of this communion with God and understanding His intimate knowledge and ways. Here, here at Genesis, my desire for our church, my focus on Sunday mornings when we gather is not the unbeliever. It's not the seeker. Though we praise God when the unbeliever and seeker comes in and we present the gospel and they encounter his presence and they make a decision to follow Jesus. Lord, that's awesome. We, we do that. But my focus is that when we gather together, we don't just get good theology and doctrine and receive information, but it's that you encounter Jesus in a real and profound way. You encounter his spirit at work in your lives. My desire for this gathering is that it would be the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. And so we come and we come as temples of the Holy Spirit. And we collectively gather as a temple of the Spirit. And we have an encounter with God. We don't just say, that was a good day at church. That was a good sermon. I feel motivated. No, we say, you know what, I have been in the presence of Almighty God today. I can feel Him. I, I experience it. And then from this place, we are sent out on mission into a world to go seek and save those that are lost and dying and broken. And I believe this is Paul's heart for the church. Is that as we encounter communion and intimacy with God and we encounter his presence, we then walk out of this place in perfect obedience and we are sent on mission into a world that needs to encounter this radical agape love. Come on. Our world needs to encounter the manifest presence of God and the agape love like never before. Like can somebody say amen this morning? All right, so seriously, we, we, we need an encounter in our day and age. Let's read on, verses 20 and 21. Paul says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Next slide here. There are three elements in this doxology that connect God to his people. What we see Paul do here is he connects God and his people in the realm of power, in the realm of glory, and in the realm of eternity. And I love this, that, that Paul says because of what God has done in Christ, and because of those that are in Christ, the church, these are three elements that should be experienced in the church from generation to generation. The first one is power. And I love it that he says, to, to him who is able. And this is linked with ability and authority. I don't know about you, but I find myself in a season where I, I find myself praying that prayer a lot. A lot where I, I see a situation at hand. And in the natural, it doesn't look like it's possible for resolve. It doesn't look like it's possible for reconciliation. It doesn't look like it's possible for unity. It doesn't look like it's possible for healing. And it can become very weighing at times, right? This season that we're in can be very heavy at times. If we're brutally honest with the reality of our world and the brokenness in our world and the sin in our world, it can become heavy on us. And it can easily lead to fear, anxiety, worry. And that's normal to feel that, by the way. There's nothing wrong with you because you feel the heaviness of that. I feel that heaviness at times. But a lot in my prayer times, I find myself saying, in the natural, I don't see how this is possible. But to him who is able, come on, to do exceedingly beyond all I can think or imagine. In the natural, I don't see how any system of man can fix this problem. But to him that is able to do exceedingly beyond all I can think or imagine in the realm of this sickness, in the realm of this disease, I don't see in the natural how there's going to be healing experience here. But to him who is able 
Why? Because he has power. He has authority. He has the ability to accomplish this. That word glory, doxa, speaks of the radiance of God's presence. I love that. The radiance of his presence. This connection between the people of God, the church, and their God is that we walk in power, not because of us, but because of him who is able. But then we also live with the glory of the Lord radiant in our lives. It's the manifest presence of God. For people just begin to recognize there's something different about that person. And yes, it's because of our ethics. Yes, it's because of how we love genuinely. But there's also something deeper. They, they say there's something about, it's like a presence. You ever had someone say that about you before? Like there's a presence to you. There's just something, there's a different spirit with you. What is that? That's, that's what Paul's talking about here for the church. A unique and different spirit. The radiance and presence of God. And then he talks about this realm, this element of eternity. But Paul is saying there that this has actually been the testimony of the church from generation to generation to generation. That no matter what persecution arises, no matter what hardships come our way, no matter how difficult things get, we can be a people that trust in a God who is able. We can walk in the manifest presence of God in our world. And we know that he has been faithful to the church from generation to generation to generation. He is doing something with his people that will not ever being stopped. And it looks hard at times. And it looks ugly at times. But God is still at work. He's still moving. He's still speaking. He's still forming people more and more to the image of his son. Amen? And this, this should give us great hope for the future. That major motif in Pauline literature, that, that eschatological hope. We should, we should look to the end and say, Oh, there's so much great that awaits us. Not, oh no, the days are dark. No, God is doing something to which he has promised to complete. Peter O'Brien said this, as the community of the redeemed, both Jews and Gentiles, the church is the masterpiece of God's grace. It is the realm of his presence and authority, the instrument through which his wisdom is made known. Simply put, the church, the people individually and collectively, is meant to be the place where God's presence is revealed to the earth. It is also meant to be the means by which the whole earth encounters the radiant presence of God from generation to generation. This is the mission of the church. And when the church does not rise in this mantle, in this anointing, in this calling, in this vocation, the world will search for anything to try to accomplish what the church was meant to accomplish. The world will seek anything because they know there's a void in their heart where justice is not met. And where the church falls short, falls short, falls short, the kingdom of this world will try to do things like they always do through their own systems, through their own governance. Through their own agendas. Beloved, I believe this is a time for the church to rise up like never before and display the manifold wisdom of God in our day and age. The diverse, the unified, the people of God walking in power and authority. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but it is going to be so worth it when we see the kingdom growing and increasing. So real quick as I close, I want to close with this question here. This question is simply, how, how, do we, how do we do this, right? How do we model the power, the authority, the manifest presence of God from generation to generation? I want you to write these down here this morning. These are simple, but I believe they're so important. Number one, we have to be continually founded in agape love. We have to be grounded. We have to be rooted in this agape love. This should be the defining marker of the church of Jesus Christ. Not our denominational stances, right? Not our buildings and our programs. Those things should not be the defining markers 
of the church, the defining marker should be they are a people that model radical love. And it's not conditional love. It's like they actually love me with no strings attached. Imagine that. Imagine what, what the world would look like if the church just modeled a love with no strings attached. Where we simply say, all are welcome, loved, and accepted. And yes, does God want to change and transform people? Yes. But he does it through his spirit at work in their lives. Our job is to what? Love. Love. Love unconditionally. Can you feel the love tonight? Yes. I got a witness over there. She's like eight years old. <laughs> right? We have one job. And it's, I am more and more convinced every single day when I stand before Jesus on judgment day. And I have to give an account as a pastor and a leader. He's not going to talk about numbers. He's not going to talk about how much we grew. He's not going to talk about even how much we gave away. He's going to ask one question. Did you learn to love? Did you learn to love my people? Did you learn to love my creation? Secondly, how do we do this? By being committed to persistent prayer. Persistent, this resolute focus. And we, we, we talked about this a lot. We love to talk about prayer in the American church, but we don't like to do it. We know that prayer is essential and important, but when it comes to actually being persistent and disciplined and setting aside the time, we struggle with that. In the day and age that we are living in, we have got to be a people that will remain resolute in our focus to pray and seek for the kingdom of God to come in the here and now. Because at the end of the day, there will be a lot of things that we face that we just don't have answers to. You ever been there? We know there's a problem. We know there's difficulty and there's practical things we can do. But we have to be a people of persistent prayer. To him that is able to do exceedingly beyond what I could think or imagine. We need to be praying your kingdom come and your will be done in this situation as it is in heaven every single day. I've been praying that a lot over the city of Bloomington. Just taking the Lord's prayer and I'm just saying, Lord, let your kingdom come and your will be done in Bloomington, Indiana as it is in heaven. Because in heaven there is no sickness and there is no death and there is no division and there is no injustice and there is no needy. In heaven there's full access to the resources of heaven, the resources of the king. And so I pray that prayer, let your, let your kingdom come to our community, to our city. And then thirdly, we do this by walking in radical Countercultural obedience. Radical countercultural obedience. That the world does not understand. If you study church history in the first three centuries of the church, you have the fact that Christianity exploded in Rome to the point that in the fourth century, 51, 52% of Rome had become Christianized. This is probably why Constantine, maybe he had a revelation, maybe he didn't, but this is probably why he named Christianity the official religion of Rome. Whenever people would talk about these Galileans, these Christians, these followers of the way, their description was always, man, these people, they don't partake in the way the world partakes. They don't love the way the world loves. They even look after those that are not their own. This is in early church history. Like they look after the widows and the orphans where the government is failing. The church does this. They, they look after the sick, the outcasts of society. They look after them. The church does that where the government fails. And the church exploded under that with no buildings, with no liberties, with no tax write-offs for giving, with no social media, right, with no lights, camera action. The church exploded in that context, because they were radical in obedience, and it was countercultural. If we're going to see a move of God today, we need to see radical obedience to the will of Jesus rise in our lives. 
We don't partake in that. Why? Because we're self-righteous. No, this is not what God has for me. We love like this. Why? Are you trying to get something in return? No, because it's the way I've been loved. We model unity. We model reconciliation. We seek reconciliation. Why? Because there's a political agenda? No, because it's the kingdom of heaven. Right? It's the kingdom of heaven. It's the ethics of the kingdom. And I believe that can bring such transformation to our world. But let me say this. There's a lot of distractions in the earth today. There's a lot of distractions, right? There's a lot of things grabbing for our attention. And I believe in this hour that we find ourselves in, we have got to be resolute and focus. God, if it's a part of your kingdom, I want to belong to it. I want to be a part of it. If it ain't a part of your kingdom, I want nothing to do with it. Not out of self-righteous elitism, but I want to be so focused on what you have for us in this day and age. We need a move. We need awakening. Crisis precedes renewal. Suffering precedes glory. And God's plan is to use this jacked up thing he calls a masterpiece, the church. To bring his glory to the earth. Amen? So I believe in the church. I've committed my life to the church. And I believe it's still God's plan A. To expand the gates of Eden in the world. And we know he's coming one day. And ultimately he will bring to completion that which he has started. But in that tension of the already and not yet. We've got work to do. We've got so much work to do. So let's be about our Father's work. Amen? Let's stand. On your chair here this morning, we have these nifty little prepackaged elements <laughs> that I never open right. I always open the first layer wrong, and then I, I have to go back. You know, the Lord's been doing a work through the coronavirus on my life. It's been a process of sanctification. Pre-corona, I swore I would never live stream. Here we are live streaming. Pre-corona, I swore I would never have people register for services. I, I like to say I have an anointing of sarcasm. My wife says it's the curse. Um, <laughs> I mocked that idea of having people pre-register for services. We had to have people register for services for five weeks because of restrictions. Pre-Rona, whenever I walked into a place and I saw a pre-packaged communion like this, oh, it stirred me up. <laughs> I love the sacredness of the table. I love when, remember, remember pre-Rona? Remember back in March and February when the last end of every month we would, the place would be packed and we'd come out to the sides and we'd have our elders at the table. The body and the blood of Jesus bless you today. Remember that? And the people would get their elements, and we'd go back, and we're all reaching into the same tray, getting the bread, and getting the cup, and no one's thinking about germs. And I love the beauty of that moment. Now, here this morning, we, we have our elements and these prepackaged, safely placed things. But I believe that in the midst of whatever method, whatever system that we currently use, the Spirit of Jesus is here. To unite us to the finished work of what he did at the cross. And I said it several weeks ago. I love that when Jesus wanted to teach his disciples about what he was about to accomplish at the cross. In inaugurating the kingdom of God. He didn't give them a theology. He didn't give them a theory. He gave them a meal. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. This is what agape love looks like. And this, this, this cup, this wine, this, this juice, however you prefer, this cup is my blood that was shed for you. This is what agape love looks like. Radical, countercultural obedience and sacrifice. And he sent these disciples on mission with this message. 
And throughout church history, there have been seasons where we've gotten that well, and we've modeled that well, and there have been seasons when we have fallen flat on our faces in modeling that. But I believe we're in a time. We're in a time where the exposure is happening in the church, and exposure is God's grace if we allow it to be. And we're having an extension given to us. Will you be the people of my body and my blood that model, model radical love and servitude to a broken, lost world? Amen? So this morning, whether you belong to this church or you don't, we invite all that are part of the church of Jesus Christ by profession of faith to participate in coming to the, not coming, sharing in the table of the Lord here today. So let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your finished work. We thank you for what you accomplished at the cross. We thank you for your body that was broken and your blood that was shed so that we might be in Christ, that we may walk in power and authority, that we might encounter the manifest presence of our living God and that we might put this on display for the world to see from generation to generation. Let your spirit be at work in us, even here and now. Amen. Let us partake of the bread. Let us partake of the cup. And let's close in singing this song collectively together here this morning. So may you go and walk in the agape love of the Father. May you commit yourself to persistent prayer. And may you walk in radical, countercultural obedience. If you would put your hands out as I declare this common prayer over us and dismissal here this morning. Almighty God, in Christ you make all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace. And in the renewal of our lives, make known your heavenly glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, forever and ever. Amen. Bless you. Have an incredible, incredible week. Walk in love. Be rooted in love. Be sent here on mission this morning. Amen. Leave this place on mission to bring transformation to a lost and hurting world. Have an incredible week. Bless you.